Welcome back to the second session. Um, and we have four very diverse talks again, so it's, it's, this is exciting. Just a reminder, when you write your questions in the chat, and thank you for getting some great questions, please write them to the panelists and attendees, not just to the panelists, so the attendees can also see the questions. And that's also so that if we get too many questions to be answered after the talk, then the speaker will type in the answer and then everyone can see the question and the answer. All right, great. So our first talk is from Monir El Mai. If you want to see if you can screen share. So Monir is from the Institute for Research on Cancer and Aging of Nice at INSERM in France. And he's going to talk about the switch from apoptosis to senescence results from conflicting tissue proliferative demands to cells unable to proliferate. So good afternoon, everyone. I would like first to thank the organizer for this uh, great opportunity for me to present, uh, present that work. Um, I'm Munir Almay, and I'm a postdoc in Miguel Goldinus Ferrara's lab. And today I will present you uh, our recent work showing that the switch from apoptosis to senescence results for conflict, conflicting tissue proliferative demands to cells unable to proliferate. Chromo chromosome ends, also named as telomeres, shorten during each cycle of cell division. This uh, phenomenon can be counteracted by telomerase, but the expression of this enzyme is limited and uh, is not sufficient to uh, counteract uh, telomere shortening with age. So telomere shorten during each, cell, uh, each cycle of cell division until they, they reach a critical uh, telomere length where they trigger DNA, a DNA damage response, leading eventually to either apoptosis or senescence. However, we currently don't know uh, what determines the cell fate between apoptosis and senescence. So in order to address that question, we are using a premature aging uh, zebrafish model, which are uh, zebrafish line, the tooth mutant, where, uh, <coughs> telomer, uh, where a telomerase defici deficiency lead to a faster telomere shortening. Indeed, as you can see here, in wild type fish, telomere shorten with age. But in tooth mutants, uh, this, um, Telomere shortening is anticipated in these fish, leading to uh, a 12 month old a telomere uh, length that is similar to those of uh, wild type at 24 months. This leads to a premature aging phenotype, as you can see here at 10 to 12 months in tooth mutants, that is similar to, uh, the, as the, to the phenotype of uh, 24 to 36 months old wild type. And as a co consequence, the survival of the tooth mutant fish is reduced compared in red, like as you can see in red compared to the wild. So we first looked at, uh, at those young fish trying to compare uh, different tissues uh, of uh, comparing tooth mutant and wild type. For this talk, I will focus on the, on the gut, but we also describe the same, similar phenomenon in other proliferative tissues. So as you can see here, uh, in this HNE staining, we couldn't uh, see when we looked at young fish, uh, we couldn't see any difference in terms of morphology between the tooth mutant and the wild type at young age. However, at that age, uh, telomere shortening already, uh, uh, already induced uh, DNA damage response, as you can see here with this uh, uh, increased levels of gamma H2AX and P53. However, we couldn't detect any difference in terms of senescence looking at uh, P16 protein level, mRNA level, or P21 mRNA. In fact, at that age, in, uh, the DNA damage response and P53 induce higher levels of apoptosis in young tooth mutant compared to a white type, as you can see here with this tunnel assay and, um, and quantify in this graph here. Uh, but we couldn't detect any sign of senescence uh, looking at P16 IFs or AC beta gal. In contrast, when we looked at all tooth mutants, uh, the all tooth mutants that I showed you earlier, uh, 
uh, we couldn't see any difference bet in terms of apoptosis between the tooth mutant and age match wild type here. However, we noticed an increase in P16 um, positive cells by IF and quantify in this graph here, and an increase in SA beta gal staining. So at that age, in all tooth mutants, senescence become predominant. Um, so we show that there is a transition between apoptosis to senescence with age of the tooth, uh, tooth mutant. And at old age, senescence become, uh, be becomes predominant. But what determines cell fate between apoptosis and senescence? Consider considering that uh, P16 accumulation has been shown in the literature to be linked to mitochondrial dysfunction, we wonder whether uh, mitochondria were affected in our third, uh, all third mutants. And as you can see here, uh, when we looked at frost levels in, all, in, young, uh, in young fish, we couldn't distinguish any difference between the third mutant and the wild type. However, the ROS level increased uh, gradually and uh, becomes higher in the church mutant compared to the wild type at all age. This was, um, this was um, uh, associated with uh, an increase of, um, uh, in, uh, of mitochondrial dysfunction, as you can see here in the old church mutant, where we could, you could see, uh, we could see more swollen uh, mitochondria rounded mitochondria and um, uh, membrane uh, di uh, disrupted mitochondria. And this was also associated with a decrease in ATP levels. So why would uh, mitochondria be, uh, be dysfunctional in, uh, in all church mutants? Oxford's defenses uh, guarantees the mitochond mitochondrial homostosis. So we went to look for that. And as you can see here, uh, we, uh, we noticed that SO2 levels, one of the, uh, the major um, uh, uh, Oxford's defense um, protein is reduced in all to, to uh, mutant compared to the wild type, which could explain the increase of uh, ROS levels and mitochondrial dysfunction. But why would SO2 be uh, downregulated in this, uh, this fish? Uh, so 2 gene can be, uh, can be transactivation by FOXO protein. And FOXO can be uh, uh, translocated outside of the nucleus and inactivated by phosphorylation. And interestingly, we noticed that uh, in all TH mutants, uh, there is a higher levels of the inactivated form of FOXO protein. We also confirmed the translocation of FOXO uh, outside of the nucleus by, uh, by um, um, co immunofluorescent staining of FOXO and P16. And we quantify the intensity uh, nuclear to uh, cytoplasmic ratio intensity of those two factors and, uh, and plot it in this graph. And as you can see here in the uh, in Turch mutant in red and orange, uh, there are um, majority, the majority of the cells have high level of P16 and low uh, nuclear P16, sorry, and low levels of nuclear FOXO compared to the wild type in gray. But why would FOXO be, uh, be inactivated in this fish? AKT is known to, to, uh, to phosphorate FOXO and inactivate it. And interestingly, we also noticed that uh, in tooth mutant, we have higher levels of the uh, activated form of, uh, of AKT, phospho AKT. So we showed that in uh, all tooth mutants, we have an activation of the, the, the mTOR AKT pathway that will, will inactivate uh, FOXO, leading to a reduction of SO2 uh, expression, uh, triggering higher loss, loss levels and mitochondrial dysfunction, and if, eventually leading to senescence. But why would this proprietive pathway will be activated in a context of cell proliferation block. When we look at, uh, when we compared young and old tooth mutants, we noticed that, in all, uh, that the old tooth mutants exhibit tissue damage. So we propose that in early age of tooth mutant, P53 is activated by telomere shortening and uh, trigger cell proliferation block and activate apoptosis. 
this will lead this will impair uh, dampen and impair the, uh, the cellular replenishment of the tissue and lead to a, a gradual uh, loss of cellularity and tissue damage. The tissue damage in turn would activate a compensatory proliferative pathway, the M4 AKD pathway, which in a, a which in a context of cell proliferation block would induce senescence. So if that's true, if this model is true, by inhibiting uh, p53, we expect to uh, to rescue senescence. So in order to test uh, this model, we then uh, inhibited p53 and use a third p53 uh, double mutant, and we showed that when we inhibit p53 in a third mutant. We reduce the, uh, the level of activated ROS, as you can see here, compared to the two mutants, and rescue sought to expression and senescence compared, senescence compared to the two mutants. Conversely, by inhibiting mTOR pathway, we also expect to, uh, to uh, rescue senescence. And uh, we also use then a model where we inhibited uh, the mTOR pathway um, in, in this uh, model here. And we showed that by inhibiting uh, uh, mTOR pathway in tert mutant, we reduce the, uh, the, the, um, the activation of AKT, and therefore we reduce the levels of P16 and therefore senescence. So in conclusion, we showed that during age, uh, of tert mutant, we have a transition between apoptosis to senescence that is due to the uh, co concomitant activation of, of two anta antagonistic pathway, the mTOR AKT proliferative pro pathway and the p53 uh, anti proliferative pathway, and this um, activation of this uh, this two pathway leads to senescence. So. To finish, I would like to thank, uh, thank you all for your attention. I would like to thank all, also my team, uh, and, uh, my, my team members, sorry, the team members, and uh, the co-authors co of this paper, the different facilities and the funding agency that, that allowed for this work to be done. And if I may, I would like to add that we recently moved to Nice in France and we are welcoming uh, postdoc and studi student applications. Thank you all for your attention. Wonderful, and thank you for being on time. Thanks. <laughs> Can I ask the first question? Sure. So, I mean, this is really cool. I don't know if you've had a chance yet, or if you have any reason to think that this mechanism in zebrafish, and I think that's an amazing model, is this also conserved in mammalian cells, for example, would you think? So we haven't, we didn't get the chance to, uh, to test that yet, but we believe that uh, this could be also um, a phenomenon that we could see in mammalians also. Uh, the thing is that, um, in the mouse, mouse model, um, we will have to wait uh, uh, more generation of, uh, to, of mutants of telomerase to, to see a, a telomere shortening uh, in, yeah, and the effect of telomere shortening in this, uh, these models. So, uh, and the other thing is that using in vitro models, uh, for instance, to study uh, human cells, um, in vitro, we are using a lot of uh, of growth factors that would then uh, that that would then induce uh, the the proper pathway, like the AKT pathway, and it will be um, trickier to 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 to, to dis disentangle that question in the in this model. But do you know if telomere shortening activates p53 in mammalian cells? Does anyone? So, yeah. For instance, in, uh, in human cells, uh, P53, yeah, telomere oh. shortening activate P53. And also in mammal, in, uh, in mice, in the, the late uh, generation of uh, telomerase, telomerase deficient uh, mice, you have activation of P53. So that brings me to Alex's, Alex Chen's question. Sure. 
which is very similar, is how does P53 mechanistically sense the shortened telomeres? So actually, um, so when telomeres shortens, uh, they become deprotected. So telomeres are a nucleo nucleoprotein, uh, nucleoproteic complex composed by uh, the, the telomere, telomeric uh, repeat sequences, DNA sequences, and, uh, and proteins that are called shelterings. And they are uh, they they protect the, the the extremity of the the chromosomes, and when they become uh, extremely short, they are they become deprotected and are recognized as a DNA damage by uh, the DNA damage response machinery. So it's ATM activation. ATM ITR activation that would let then trigger uh, P53. Okay, cool. So while anyone else is wanting to type a question. I just want to say that Miguel, your boss, if he's there, hi. When I was a new faculty member 21 years ago at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, Miguel was a postdoc there. Mm -hmm. He was working on um, telomeres in Pombi sure. with Julie Cooper. And he used to come up to my office and we used to have these long conversations about DNA damage checkpoints. Sure. So it's great watching his work evolve from telomeres in Pombi to now in his own lab working on zebrafish and aging. And, and I'm sure that he's... Might be to Nice, Miguel, <laughs> when we're allowed to travel. Thank you very much, Jess. It's a pleasure to see you. It's very nice to be I'm here. to see you. <laughs> and, and also doing dog sitting, which was very nice. Okay, if we don't have any more questions, we will move on. Wonderful stuff. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna nice now have a talk from Morgan, Morgan Levine, sorry, at the Yale School of Medicine. And the talk is entitled, A Rat Epigenetic Clock Recapitulates Phenotypic Aging and Co-Localizes with Heterochromatin. Okay, th thank you so much. Thank you to the organizers um, for having me. I'm really excited to present this work, which is really, even though I'm presenting it, a collaboration between my group and also uh, Rafa de Cabo and Luigi Ferrucci at the NIA. Um, so just to jump right in, a brief background on epigenetic clocks. So basically what these are is these are estimates of biological age based on measures of DNA methylation. Um, so we think these are really important because DNA methylation is an epigenetic mark that plays a really important role in a number of different cellular processes. Um, but what people have found is that there are striking changes in the patterns of DNA methylation across the genome as cells or individuals age. Um, so what people have done is we've used advanced kind of machine learning techniques to estimate biological age using these patterns of change across DNA methylation. And clocks have been developed using as few as one CPG location to often up to a million CPG locations. Um, so the first epigenetic clock was developed in humans, actually using human twins in 2011. Uh, 2011. Uh, that was the Bockland et al. paper. And since then, there's been a plethora of other epigenetic clocks developed mostly in humans and some in mice. Um, and actually, some of you might know, so currently Steve Horvath is actually doing mammalian epigenetic clocks, so across hundreds of different mammalian species. But the aim of this paper was to develop uh, an epigenetic clock for rats, which at the time had not been published yet. So the other uh, difference kind of that with um, our approach versus some of the epigenetic clock approaches that have been used before is that we really try to use what's called an unsupervised machine learning approach. Um, so just to put that in context with what's been used. So most of the epigenetic clocks that have been developed use what's called a supervised approach. So this is you traditionally train a clock by using some measure of ground truth that you're trying to predict. Most often in the epigenetic clocks, this has been using chronological age. So what we, we can call these clocks chronological age predictors. Um, however, there's a number of drawbacks for this. Um, number one is that the whole point of making 
a biological age estimate is to decouple biological aging from chronological aging because we know chronological age is an imperfect proxy of biological aging. Um, there's also issues with mortality selection um, and the fact that you actually might be picking up epigenetic changes that may not be actually causal or important um, in aging, but are just bystanders of changes with time. So, so the idea with the supervised approach is that you need some ground truth. However, when we're trying to estimate biological aging, we think of this as what we call um, a latent variable. It's something not observable. So there's actually no real ground truth. And there's been some debate um, in the field on what people should actually use as this ground truth in which we're trying to predict. Um, so for this study, we actually took a different approach. We use an unsupervised approach. So this is not tethered to any variable. We basically are just looking at patterns of change in our data um, that are, were previously undetected. So we don't need to determine uh, that we're trying to make an age predictor. And assuming you have a data set with sufficient kind of variability in this dimension that you're interested in, um, it actually might be ideal for uncovering some of these kind of latent or unobservable patterns. Um, and this is the case for biological aging that because it's latent, we actually want to understand these kind of multi-dimensional patterns of change rather than uh, making an age predictor per se. Um, so for this, uh, again, I mentioned we're doing this in rats. So we had male Fisher rats uh, between the ages of one and 27 months. And we had a really nice age distribution where we had six rats at each month of age. So one month, two months, et cetera. Um, we also had data that we used for blood to measure um, DNA methylation. We also had information on facts, so we um, knew cell composition, and there's behavioral testing done. So we had information on rotor rod, open field as well. Uh, so to develop our epigenetic clock, we split our data into what we call training sample, which was about 100 rats, and our testing or our validation sample, which was about 30 rats. And first, we actually tried a number of more sophisticated unsupervised approaches that considered um, kind of nonlinear effects. And really what came out was that actually a very simple one, principal component analysis, did just as well. So uh, we ended up just going with that because it's better just to keep it simple if possible. Um, so what we did is we ran principal component analysis. And really what we found is that the first component actually captured this aging effect that we were interested in. Um, so this is just showing, this is called a scree plot, so the pr proportion of variance explained by each of these components. So this is the first one. And this is if we just plot age, so this is chronological age, against this first principal component, which we converted into units of years in our validation sample. And what we find is that you actually get a correlation between age and this uh, principal component of 0 0.93 in the validation sample. Um, so the next thing is, again, you know, there's some debate on how do you validate uh, a bi biological age measure. So yes, it should track with chronological age. It's important to have a correlation, a high correlation with chronological age, but more importantly is actually relating it uh, to other aging outcomes of interest. So for this, we use composite measures of cell composition using the FACTS data, as well as phenotypic aging measure using the Rotorod uh, and that should say open field and open field data. And we put these in a um, multivariate model. And basically what we find is that when you adjust for age, we still see an association with our epigenetic age measure and this phenotypic age aging measure, which means even among rats of the same chronological age, having a higher epigenetic age is associated with higher phenotypic aging. And the same thing holds even when we adjust for cell composition. So this is not explained by differences in kind of cell proportions in the blood data. We also then actually took this equation and used um, previously developed RBS data in mice and actually applied this exact same equation to the mouse data. And what we find again, this is the rat data, is that we actually get a high correlation between age and this epigenetic aging measure in mice. Um, and interestingly, we also had mice that were either calorie restricted versus controlled. And what we find is that the calorie restricted mice had lower epigenetic ages. And I'm not showing this figure, but we actually also showed that the longer the mice have been calorie restricted, 
the bigger the difference in their epigenetic ages. So it seems like it's this kind of cumulative thing or that it actually might not just be lowering your epigenetic age, but actually slowing the rate of change in epigenetic age. Um, but you know, the one thing that we kind of struggle with with these epigenetic clocks are that they end up being very much a black box. So these are composite measures of a lot of different changes happening in the methylome that might not actually mechanistically map onto the same thing. So it's really important to kind of step back and maybe take a more reductionistic approach where we can decompose these signals and then try to map them onto specific epigenetic uh, changes that are happening with aging. Um, so for this, what we did is we use a clustering approach, so a, a network analysis approach, and we're actually to able to take the approximately 3,000 CPGs that were in our measure and actually cluster them and assign them to these different co-methylation, what are called networks or modules. So these are groups of CPGs that seem to be operating similarly. They're changing the same um, across different samples. So we found four of these modules and actually most of the CPGs in our measure were not assigned to a module. They were not um, strongly connected to a bunch of other CPGs that were changing. So that was about 95%. So then what we can do is say, let's look at our original measure and see which of these modules is playing a big role in the overall epigenetic age score. Um, so this is showing the PC loading. So how strongly, um, so the absolute value would be how strong a role it's playing in that score. And when we find our CPGs in this green module have a large influence on our epigenetic age score in both directions. So these are CPGs that are becoming both hypo and hypermethylated with age. Um, conversely, CPGs in the purple and blue modules um, tend to be ones that have a strong positive association. So these are ones that are becoming hypermethylated with age. Um, whereas the pink ones are not influencing it that much. And the gray, these are unassigned or kind of random, but really with the kind of centered at zero, so not having a strong influence. So next, what we did is we actually made what are called sub-module scores. So again, we split our um, epigenetic clock measure into a bunch of these modules, and then we can just make a measure, a clock specific to a module, and ask what are its associations with age, with phenotypes, um, and with color restriction. So these plots at the uh, top are just showing the age correlations for, for these sub-module scores, so you find that in both rat and mouse, the green module has a high age correlation, as does the purple, and slightly weaker, but we also find it in the blue. And again, there's no age correlation in this kind of pink module. But again, going past that, we looked again at the association with our phenotypic age variable after adjusting for chronological age, and it seems the green and the blue modules were associated there. I'm not showing um, the actual statistics, but they're in the paper. We also find that all four modules were reduced by calorie restriction. And then we also looked at reprogrammed fibroblasts or reprogramming to induce pluripotent stem cells. And in that case, only the green and the blue module seemed important. So for this reason, we started to focus in more on the green and blue module as they were associated with all four of these phenotypes. And so we looked more at kind of the um, genomic features of these two modules. So basically what we find is that both the green and the blue module tend to be associated with CPGs in these intergenic regions. They also tended to be um, in regions of high CPG density. So these might be what we call CPG islands. Um, and, and we also were able to find uh, what they co-located in. So there was enrichment uh, for locations that co-locate with H3K9 trimethylation and H3K27 trimethylation. So in conclusion, um, what we did in this paper was we presented the first published epigenetic clock in rats. We found that it's a robust epigenetic age, oh, we found that robust epigenetic age biomarkers can be developed even using unsupervised machine learning methods. So you don't have to use chronological age or some other proxy measure to train to. Um, so again, in part one, we generated this composite epigenetic age measure. It was associated with phenotypic or functional aging, conserved in mice. It was reduced by calorie restriction. And I didn't show this data, but we also um, have a figure in the paper showing that it can be 
were programmed via Yamanaka factors. In part two, we actually were able to decompose the signal and identify two really important, what we might call modules or parts of the clock. Um, they're enriched in intergenic regions and they overlap with H3K9 trimethylation, H3K27 trimethylation, which really kind of points to this idea that it's actually capturing something about changes in heterochromatin structure with aging. Um, and with that, I just want to acknowledge uh, the team that participated on this group, especially uh, Luigi and Rafa, who are actually the other two corresponding authors um, on this paper, and also our funding, and happy to take questions. Thank you, Morgan. That was fantastic. Okay, so we have a question from YL. The first PC is used as DNA MH. Here, the PCA is based on all the CPG methylation data from the microarray. So that's the question. Is it you based on all the CPG methylation data from the microarray? A second question, the first PC can explain the most variance in your study. Is it specific for your current data? I mean, the first PC may be not, cannot capture the most variance in other data set. Yes, yeah, so um, to start at the first question. So yes, we actually ended up using the first PC. The first PC um, here is based on, we had RBS data, so it's not a micro, right? So for humans, we use the arrays. Um, for mice, actually there are arrays that were just developed, but for this, we use RBS data. We started with a few million CPGs, but what we did here was just take the CPGs that are overlapped between our study and the mouse validation studies. Um, so it was based on all the CPGs that are overlapped. It was, I think, only about 3,000 though. Um, so yes, the first PC is based on all of those. Um, for the second question here, I, I, I agree. Um, I think the reason the first PC worked so well was because it, if, for people uh, who know about PCA, most of our variance was in that age domain, right? We had a really wide age range and these were all fairly homogeneous rats. So I think that's why the first PC ended up being this aging measure. We've done a lot um, with these unsupervised approaches in humans. And that first PC is not always the one that's of interest. And it, it actually does, doesn't really have to do with how much variance it explains. It's really, you know, it might be the fourth PC that's of interest. I don't want to go too much into the kind of the statistical details, but um, yeah, we, I, it's not a given that that first PC is going to be the one that we should focus on. Okay, Maria Ricchetti has a question that I too was wondering, how long are you doing the calorie restriction for? You mentioned it was, if it was longer, you had a larger effect. And also what was the level of the CR? For example, was it 30% less than normal or ad libitum? Um, to tell you the truth, I don't know that off the top of my head. I wasn't the one that did the calorie restriction, um, but I believe it's in the paper. Um, yeah, I can't remember. All the animals were started at the same time, and then we assessed uh, methylation at different ages. So the one, the older animals had been on calorie restriction longer. But yeah, I'd have to. It wasn't throughout the whole lifespan. It, it wasn't that long. It was. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to say because I might be off, but yeah, it wasn't. Okay, we had another great question from Joris Dillon. Have you also measured additional omic layers in these rats, such as proteomics, metabolomics, and transcriptomics, to see if these can improve your clocks and to de determine if these epigenetic changes represent changes in specific molecular pathways? Um, so we have not. Uh, I believe that they that uh, Rafa and Luigi do have some stored um, plasma and serum from the rats. So that, you know there is a possibility to do that. Um, I'm actually working on a collaboration with them and also um, Vadim Gladyshev to do this in the SLAM uh, cohort, which is a mouse cohort. But in that um, example, we are hoping to have multiomics and really actually be able to dig into what pathways are being affected and to get a, you know, maybe more of these multi-omic aging measures, you know, as opposed to just focusing on methylation as well. So, I mean, I was kind of wondering with the, you said there's intergenic regions, mm -hmm. are they in heterochromatin? Are they regions of known, um, you know, repetitive elements like line elements? 
because we know they get activated during aging and also in cancer. And there's a lot of really cool recent work saying that they promote aging when they're expressed. Yeah, so it, it actually, it was interesting when we looked at these regions, if you look um, at the mouse um, annotation, they, they did say that they were in repetitive regions. Um, the rat annotation did not, so we didn't really go into it that much in the paper, but it, there is a hint that that actually might be what's going on here. Yeah, so the oh, transcriptomics yeah. would be really cool. To yeah, look absolutely. Expression. All right, and we also have the link to Morgan's paper. Okay, so I think we're pretty much perfectly on time. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you so much. Okay, so our third talk in this session is from Dudley Lamming from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Talk is that ovariectomy uncouples lifespan from metabolic health and reveals a sex hormone dependent role of hepatic mtop2 in aging and your slides are up it's looking good so take it away great thank you very much so many of us are familiar with the idea that rapamycin extends lifespan so rapamycin is a drug originally found on easter island or as the native call it rapa nui um, and many different studies by the ni's intervention testing program and others have shown robust extension in both sexes um, using this drug, and it's shown many beneficial effects um, in some other organisms as well. So why don't we all start taking rapamycin? Well, rapamycin is approved as an FDA, is an FDA approved immunosuppressant, and the number of studies that have been done um, so far on healthy people taking uh, rapamycin is very limited. Um, but overall, there are some studies um, that show that side effects um, in people taking relatively high doses include increased infections, various dermatological events, um, and metabolic consequences as well. And this was something that I was really interested in when I was a postdoc, starting to look at some of these metabolic effects of rapamycin. Um, typically, they're not what we would normally think of as associated with um, longevity in general. Um, they include hyperlipidemia, decreased insulin sensitivity, glucose intolerant, and uh, it appears that there's an increased risk of new onset diabetes as well. And so when we began digging into this, um, we found that we could reproduce this in mice, um, in multiple strains of mice. Here we show black six mice on the left, as well as HET3 mice used by the NIS intervention testing program on the right. It applies in both males and females. It doesn't matter whether you deliver rapamycin IP or in the diet, you get very robust glucose intolerance. Um, and so what is the molecular basis for this? We don't have time to go into the full story today, but using hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamps, we found that there was an effect on hepatic insulin sensitivity. Um, Rapamycin-treated animals produce more glucose from their liver um, in the basal condition during the clamp. And when high levels of insulin are used to suppress that hepatic gluconeogenesis, vehicle-treated mice experience much more suppression than rapamycin-treated animals. Now, rapamycin's molecular target is called mTOR complex one. It's a protein kinase that regulates many different um, longevity pathways, including S6K and 4EBP. And it's sensitive to stresses, including amino acids and glucose. And what we did was to knock out mTOR complex one, the liver genetically. And interestingly, we found this had no effect on glucose tolerance or hepatic insulin resistance. And so we began to think about, about the possibility of rapamycin hitting a second target, mTOR complex two. mTOR complex two is primarily a factor of PI3K signaling, um, and it doesn't directly regulate the same set of targets, although probably it is functionally upstream of mTOR complex one. And while mTORC2 was initially characterized as rapamycin resistance, some work in David Sabatini's lab by Das Sabaros um, in 2006 had shown that in cell culture and to a degree in at least one mouse tissue or two, um, mTOR complex two could be inhibited by uh, chronic rapamycin treatment. And so we wanted to know whether this was true in the liver as well. Um, and to do this, we treated mice with rapamycin. 
And we then uh, performed immunoprecipitation experiments where we IP'd mTOR and looked for the association of the mTOR protein kinase with either Richter, a subunit specific to mTOR2, or Raptors, units specific to mTOR complex 1. You could see vehicle treated mice here on the left. Um, essentially, there's good association of mTOR into both complexes, whereas in rapamycin treated animals, there's a good disruption of both complexes. So um, to complete these studies, we made a mouse model in which we deleted Richter specifically in the liver of um, specifically in the liver using an albumin Cree driver and call these mice the L-RKO mice. We'll show talk about them in the context of this eLife paper shortly. Um, and these mice we characterize as having glucose intolerance as well as pyruvate intolerance as well. Um, and so we're able to reproduce the effects on hepatic insulin sensitivity simply by deleting Richter specifically in the liver. And using um, clamp studies, we were able to show um, that indeed mTOR complex 2 mediates these effects. So this led us to try and address a question that I actually started working on and thinking about about 13 years ago now, um, which was, does rapamycin actually promote longevity via inhibition of mTOR complex 1? Or does mTOR complex 2 play a role in this effect as well? Um, and so to address this question, about six years ago, we published a paper looking at the lifespan of animals where we disrupted uh, Richter genetically. Um, here on the top, looking at the black versus the blue, the blue are Richter heterozygous mice. They have one deletion of one copy of uh, Richter, this mTOR complex two subunit. We got about a 40% inhibition of longevity. And in males, we saw about a 30% decrease in longevity when we deleted Richter specifically in the liver. And so interestingly enough, this effect was sexually dimorphic. And so the question we wanted to try and address was what is actually happening here and why is mTOR complex 2 inhibition so deleterious um, in the case of males? And so we started thinking about this. And of course, sex hormones underlie um, many different sexually dimorphic phenotypes. And it's relatively straightforward to start addressing that question. And so we used a prepubertal gonectomy approach um, to try and understand whether sex hormone mediated the effect of hepatic Richter deletion on lifespan as well as metabolism. And our initial hypothesis was that either castration would protect the Richter knockout males, um, essentially by feminizing them, um, or that two, ovarectomy would sensitize um, the, L the liver Richter knockout females by removing the protective effects of estrogen. So in this paper, um, what we did was we characterized the um, phenotypes of mice longitudinally. Um, we looked at a number of different phenotypes. Of course, one of the most simple is weight. And you can see here that the wild type males are actually the heaviest throughout the study, um, whereas castrated males, as well as liver Richter knockout males have a bit of a lower weight. Um, in terms of females, the overectomized mice weigh much more than the wild type or the LKR or sham surgery animals. Um, and this actually fits pretty well with our expectation about what gonectomy should do to animals. Um, we know that testosterone in particular is associated with building lean mass. And we looked at the body composition of these animals using a, an echo MRI scanner. And what we found was that the castrated animals of both genotypes indeed had less lean mass um, than their intact counterparts. Um, in the case of ovarectomy, Overall, we know um, that estrogen in females is generally believed to be protective against metabolic dysfunction. Um, and we saw that there's a lot of more adipose mass in early life um, in the overectomized animals than in the intact females. Um, and you can see that those differences disappear around 16 to 18 months of age. Um, mice don't go through menopause like humans do, but they sort of go through a reduction in estrogen around this time period in their life. And probably that's why uh, the body compositions here begin to come together. Looking at metabolism, um, we found interestingly that castration didn't um, on its own have a particularly negative effect um, on metabolism in the animals. Um, and that as we expected, the liver Richter knockout males um, did indeed um, have glucose intolerance. And you could see that there's an overall effect of genotype as well as an individual effect um, in both the sham and the castrated animals. In females, um, estrogen is believed to be protective against um, diabetes as well as obesity. And so um, we expected that there would be um, a negative effect on glucose tolerance when we um, uh, perform gonectomy on these animals. 
And indeed, that's what we found. We found that um, there was an overall effect of overectomy um, in terms of impaired glucose tolerance, in addition to an overall effect of Richter deletion. Now, one of the things that we wanted to do in this study was try and get some insight into um, what the effects of uh, liver Richter knockout, as well as the uh, gonadectomies, had on a cause of death. And cause of death and analysis in mice is very difficult. But one thing that is relatively easy to do is to try and understand whether the animals um, die with cancer. Um, you can't necessarily say that they died from cancer, although I think we can draw that supposition in many cases if we see that the animal has a lot of cancer. Um, but we necropsied the animals and just scored whether or not they had cancer um, during this gross necropsy. And so in males, interestingly enough, we found um, the mice that died with observable cancer, um, there wasn't really any uh, differences between any of the genotypes or surgeries. So all the groups had very similar effects. In contrast, the mice that um, we didn't see cancer uh, during necropsy, um, those are the animals that seem to be living shorter. In the case of the males, you can see that the liver Richter knockout uh, males here in red have a reduced lifespan. And there's an overall increase in the hazard ratio um, when we delete Richter. Um, you can see the castrated animals, very similar overall effect. And castration did not protect um, the animals in this case. And so if we put all the mice together, including the ones that um, where we were unable to to score a cause of death or uh, cancer at death due to the fact that the animals had decayed too quickly. Um, what we find is that, again, um, Richter knockout um, has a negative effect on lifespan, so that's um, reproducible. Um, it was smaller in this particular study. All of the animals in this case lived longer um, in the mouse facility we are in, in at UW-Madison than in my former lab when I was in David Sabatini's lab at MIT. Um, so the animals live uh, significantly longer here, but there's still a negative effect of liver Richter deletion. Um, and castration had no um, positive effects on those phenotypes. Now, in the females, again, we found that um, when we found the mice that died with cancer, there wasn't any effect between any of the genotypes or um, gonectomy groups. Um, but there was a really interesting effect in the females. So in the females, the sham surgery animals had a vastly reduced lifespan um, relative to all of the other groups. And so these are mice where we didn't find cancer and necropsy. Those animals were shorter. And this was very unexpected because in our initial study, we found that there was no effect um, of Richter loss on female longevity. And overectomy rescued these animals. So if you remember our original hypothesis, we thought that um, overectomy would actually be protective uh, or rather um, negative for the animals because they'd be more like males, which had this negative effect on lifespan. And we found that the opposite is true. So overectomy seems to protect those animals very dramatically. Um, when we look at the overall effect, um, we see that there's no overall effect of Richter. And in fact, there's, um, again, still no cha significant change in the overall lifespan um, when we delete Richter in uh, female mice. Um, overall, there's about 6% decrease, and it doesn't reach statistical significance um, by log rank test. Um, and overectomy seems overall to be protective, although that's driven by the dramatic effects um, on the liver Richter knockout mice. And so um, in conclusion, um, We've, we've, our conclusions um, are, are quite interesting and we're not what we expected. So first of all, um, the sex-specific effect of reduced hepatic mTOR complex 2 on lifespan that we initially found um, was not reversed by depletion of sex hormones in, in either males or females. And we found really surprisingly that loss of hepatic mTOR complex 2 negatively impacted survival of those females um, who did not die with observable cancer. Um, and you know, that doesn't mean that they didn't have cancer at all. We didn't do the type of detailed histology that would be necessary to make that conclusion. Um, but certainly there was nothing observable um, during our gross necropsy. Um, and overectomy was protective um, of those animals. So it protected midwife survival overall of female mice lacking hepatic mTOR complex two. And it does this by increasing the survival of those mice which do not develop cancer because it doesn't seem to have an effect on the mice that die with observable cancer. And finally, we found that prepubertal overectomy really uncouples lifespan from metabolic health. So the overectomized mice typically lived um, longer, and particularly in the case of the protective um, effect on the Richter female knockouts. Um, despite the fact that they were heavier, they had more adipose mass, they were glucose intolerant, they had some insulin resistance as well. Um, so metabolically, they weren't healthy, but if anything, they tended to live longer, and there certainly wasn't a negative effect on lifespan.
So I'd like to thank um, everyone who was involved in the study that was really driven by my former postdoc, Sebastian Ariola Apello, um, who's now faculty um, at UW-Madison. Um, but many others in the lab contributed. And I'd like to particularly thank AFAR, which was primarily responsible um, for, for funding this as a junior investigator grant. Thank you. Thank you, Dudley. Great talk. Although you're making me feel really cold there. Are you not cold? <laughs> well, people were saying that uh, my backyard couldn't possibly look like that anymore when I was showing the summer photo. So I, I, we just got a nice snowfall yesterday. Oh, that's that's from yesterday? Uh, Saturday, rather. Wow. OK, we got some good questions here. So from Alex Chen, how about ketosis and mTOR2 inhibition, i.e. rapamycin and ketosis? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, so we, we have been doing a project where we're trying to characterize some of the effects on uh, metabolic pathways. And we do see that there seems to be um, some additional ketones, I believe, in the male Richter knockout animals, but not the females, I think. Um, and we don't exactly understand um, why that is, but certainly um, it makes sense that the animals probably, through an inability to sense insulin, probably think that they're in a bit more of a fasted state. And just to clarify, um, Alex added, i.e., are the effects of mTOR2 induced glucose intolerance not detrimental in the context of a high MUFA keto low carb diet? Mm, that's an interesting question. Um, we did. I did do a study. Um, that, that we never got around to publishing. It was a relatively small study where we tried feeding the animals a high fat diet um, to see if that would compensate for the fact that um, they have a lipogenesis defect as well. Um, and there was, no, there was no effect of a high fat diet in terms of being able to rescue those animals. Now that wasn't exactly a ketogenic diet, but um, it was high fat rather than Western. So it was not, a, not there wasn't elevated levels of sucrose there. So I'm, you know, I work on aging and yeast. They don't, they don't have livers. So are you saying that rap, high doses of rapamycin can predispose to diabetes? Well, it's been shown that in humans, um, people who are on immunosuppressants, and this is complicated by the fact that all immunosuppressants typically have some negative effect on metabolism. But people have shown that serolimus in particular increases um, the overall risk of developing uh, type 2 diabetes. And so some people say that's like a 20% elevation risk. I think I've seen as much as fivefold. Um, but certainly there, most studies agree that um, to the extent that it can be parsed out because people are on multiple immunosuppressants, that does increase the risk of uh, new onset diabetes. Um, you know, something that's relevant, right, is that people who are already sick may not have the same um, exact profile. And a lot of people who take this for tubular sclerosis are taking very high doses. Um, and so, you know, it may not be relevant to a, to a pro-longevity phenotype, but that's definitely been seen in humans. Matt, do you see that in the dogs? Um no, uh, but I think again, there's there's a couple. I mean, we haven't. First of all, our longest study in dogs has been six months, right, of treatment. So, uh, so I think there's a, a duration component um, and a dose component. So I think Dudley, the way Dudley explained it, I think is 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 right. That you know, in people, these are sick people taking high doses of the drug in combination with other things, and there there clearly is an elevated risk for metabolic consequences. Um, we just don't know in healthy people, you know, or, or dogs or mice taking lower doses, how, how important this is. And, and since I'm speaking, I'll just, I'll just give my sort of opinion on this. I, I, I think the question in my mind is we know that the, the mice that are long lived as Dudley and others have shown repeatedly, um, on, on the doses of rapamycin that extend lifespan have what would typically be thought of as glucoregulatory phenotypes, right? They're, they have a loss of what people typically would consider glucose homeostasis. What's unclear to me is whether that phenotype is bad, good, or indifferent for longevity. I think we just don't know at this point. My gut feeling is that what it's really reflecting is a change in the way that mice on rapamycin are, um, what their preferred metabolic state is. And it 
it may not be bad, but if you give them a non-physiological glucose tolerance test, they don't perform well. And so I think this is still remains to be, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to really understand what's going on. And, and I think Dudley's, you know, one of the leaders in, in figuring this out. Thank you. Yeah, and Alex suggests take um, metformin with rapamycin. Oh, though no, that's certainly it's certainly a possibility, and mouse studies have shown that I believe that that's protective in one sex, but not the other. Um, but I don't remember which one. Okay, so Nainita asks, what is the effect of high animal protein diet on mTOR? Um, I mean, overall, it's been shown by uh, Steve Simpson and Samantha Solon Beignet that um, dietary protein levels correlate very well with mTOR um, activity in the liver. Um, and we and Luigi Fontana have shown that um, in mice, uh, generally speaking, uh, protein restricted diets seem to lower mTOR activity in multiple tissues. Um, so it seems to correlate very well um, dietary protein and mTOR. And Kai Zia asks, what to expect in your study if the mice were castrated when they were adults? Well, that's a very interesting point because the existing um, literature actually suggests that um, castration as an uh, a rather overectomy um, in post-pubertal mice is actually detrimental for lifespan, whereas in our study we see a positive effect. And so, you know, I think overall that um, studies in insects and C. elegans generally have supported the idea that um, overectomy is uh, beneficial to lifespan. Um, and I think maybe that's in young animals more started pre-puberty before reproduction begins. Whereas this post-pubertal um, overectomy definitely um, in rats and mice has been shown to be detrimental. Um, we were a little bit surprised about the castration result because castration has also been uh, shown to be associated with longevity in multiple species, including humans. But in those cases, there's an aggression factor that also needs to be taken into account. Um, and so perhaps in, in our mice, which are relatively placid and happy and not aggressive, um, that wasn't really a factor. Or it might be a factor of the fact that we did castration prior to puberty. All right. Thank you very much, Dudley. Thank so you the very last much. Talk of this session is from Amanda Kaolazic. I apologize if I mispronounced that, which I'm sure I did. You're fine. <laughs> Amanda's at the Car Carnegie Mellon University, the University of Pittsburgh, and she is a graduate student in the joint PhD program of computational biology between those two institutions. And Amanda's going to tell us about pan mammalian analysis of molecular constraints underlying extended lifespan. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you guys can see my screen all right. It looks great. Okay, awesome. So yes, I'm Amanda Kowalczyk. Thanks you. Thank you for the valiant effort at pronunciation. And I'm sort of going to zoom way out in my talk. Our goal was to use sort of the powers of convergent evolution to try to find the genetic underpinnings of longevity across all, ma all mammal species. So since I study evolution, I like to start these types of talks by acknowledging the incredible diversity of life on planet Earth. Perhaps it isn't surprising that we observe this incredible diversity because the Earth itself is super diverse and each of these species is uniquely adapted to survive and thrive in their respective environments. What may in fact be more surprising is when we see less diversity than we may expect, or when species that are not closely related or unrelated develop similar phenotypes. And when that, ha when that happens, we call it convergent evolution, and the classic example is depicted over here. Birds and bats independently developed the flight phenotype, and we call that convergent evolution. And we, when we see this type of phenotypic convergence, we may also expect to see genetic convergence. And by looking for the concordance between those two sort of signals, we can try to link genes to their associated phenotypes. So my goal was to do that, of course, for longevity. And to do that, longevity must be convergent, which fortunately it is, but I can demonstrate that for you right here. 
So this is showing the 61 mammal species included in the UCSC 100-way alignment, for which I also have longevity data. This is the phylogenetic tree representing their evolutionary relationships. And here are their maximum longevity values from the NH senescence and longevity database. So I can pull out the species that are very long-lived. You can see that they are pretty distantly related. So they are convergently long-lived. And the same is true for short-lived species. So overall, this indicates that yes, longevity is a convergently evolving phenotype. Another thing that we can pick out just based on the species that I have selected is that when we consider longevity from this cross species perspective, it's very heavily confounded with body size. Species that are large also tend to be long lived and species that are small also tend to be short lived. We were interested in both of these phenotypes. So how a species evolves to be large and long lived as well as how a species evolves to be small and short lived. Um, but we were interested in the unconf in unconfounded phenotype as well. So the sort of more classic independently long lived phenotype. To get at both of those sort of contrasting phenotypes, we had to invent brand, brand new phenotypes, or I should say calculate brand new phenotypes. We did that using principal component analysis. I'm not going to go through the steps for the sake of time. Um, but basically, principal component analysis works by fitting lines, like you can picture it graphically, like fitting lines to the data and then projecting points down onto the lines and the distance along these sort of fit lines are the new principal component values. So if we look at this as body size versus lifespan on log scale, they're very strongly linearly related. And I can pull out the first and second principal components. PC1 represents the agreement between body size and lifespan. So the extreme values are things like whales and elephants that are big and long lived and shrew mouse, these small rodents that are small and short lived. PC2 is the sort of independently long lived phenotype. This is lifespan corrected for body size. And so the extreme va values are things like bat and the naked mole rat that are exceptionally long lived given their size. So now we have this phenotype information and we wanna connect it with some genetic information. And to do that, we have this method that we've been developing in the lab called RER Converge that can link any genomic regions to a convergently evolving phenotype. So if you're interested in these types of analyses I'm about to talk about, um, it's available on GitHub, please check it out. Lots of people like to use it for their, their phenotypes. It's very fun, pretty easy to use. But so the genomic information that this method uses is relative evolutionary rates. These are calculated from plain old vanilla evolutionary rates. These are calculated over a phylogeny where the branch lengths represent the amount of evolutionary change that has happened along that branch. So just like the number of substitutions that is predicted to have happened in the sequence. They're converted into relative evolutionary rates through a bunch of very fancy statistical corrections to make the behavior of these data nicer. Um, but the main one uh, that you guys might be interested in is this average rate normalization. This is what makes them relative evolutionary rates. So each branch length is normalized for the average rate of evolution on that branch genome wide. This corrects for the fact that some species evolve faster than others. And I'll point out that in this data set, we have about 20,000 genes. So this is, we have one tree for every single gene. So there are about 20,000 trees with uh, relative evolutionary rates for those proteins. We also have trait information. Again, we have the PC1 and PC2 phenotypes to represent the long-lived large-bodied phenotype and the independently long-lived phenotype. We know what those values are for the extant species and we can predict what they were for the non-living species for these ancestral species. And then our branch lengths are just the difference in values between the nodes. So the branch lengths then represent the phenotype change along that branch. Then we put that information together to look for correlations between evolutionary rates and the trait values. Point out, this is just a little a sketch sort of of this, but each of these dots represents one branch. So basically each dot is a species, whether they are a living species or a, a non-living species. If we see a significant correlation between our trait values and our evolutionary rates, that indicates that that gene is associated with the phenotype. 
I'm going to focus on mostly the negative correlations because we saw very little signal in the other direction, positive correlations. We believe that negative correlations are indicating genes that are more important for the phenotype, so more important to evolving to be a large and long-lived species because they're evolving slower, because they're being protected from mutations, because their functions are very important. I also want to point out a really important distinction between these sort of uh, positive correlations, which would indicate faster evolution in the long-lived large body and independently along this species versus these negative correlations. I'm sort of take looking at this from a more conceptual level. Sometime in evolutionary history, we had the ancestral mammal that was probably small and short-lived. And then there was some period of a selective pressure shift during which time this small short-lived mammal evolved to be large and long-lived along some of the mammalian lineages and at some point that stabilized and now we have the phenotypes that we observe today. During the time that this trait change was occurring there were genes, there must have been genes that were evolving faster, that were under positive selection in order to generate this phenotype change. This must have happened. Um, but at some point, when this phenotype stabilized, these genes were relaxed from this sort of positive selection and went back to neutral evolutionary rates. So as a result, this is sort of explaining why we aren't seeing a lot of these positive correlations, because in evolutionary time, this period of positive selection of accelerated evolution was very brief. So at the end of the day, we're actually capturing very small rate shifts, sort of an average out over this time period. But on the other hand, when these genes were under positive selection, there was a whole shift in the evolutionary rates landscape, landscape in many, many genes, including some that were very important to enable this evolution, but were not driving it. And those genes would have been under increased purifying selection because they were being protected from accumulating mutations. And then when the trait was established, they continued to be under purifying selection to enable the trait to continue to persist. So as a result, we're able to capture these rates. This is why we're able to see these negative correlations more strongly than the positive correlations. But this also is a really important distinction between my work and what a lot of other people do in that what I'm looking at is genes that enable species to be long-lived rather than genes that cause them to be long-lived. So everything that I'm going to be talking about is sort of in this camp where these are functions, genes, pathways that are required to allow these species to continue to be long-lived. So I had all of my gene results. I did pathway enrichment to do some sort of more functional analysis of them. And this is a representation of those pathway enrichment results for the PC1 phenotype, the long-lived large-bodied phenotype. Each of these dots is a pathway that's significantly enriched and the lines between them are just representing the number of genes they have in common to help us sort of sort through the redundancy and pathway annotations. For PC1, we see lots of immune pathways, cell death pathways, a very specific set of DNA repair pathways, and cell cycle control pathways that are really important to enable species to grow to be large and long-lived. And what's interesting about this is that these pathways all work together to prevent cancer. So if we think about how cancer happens, it starts as DNA damage that causes unchecked cell cycle progression and, and or inadequate cell death. Those cancerous cells that evade the immune system and in some cases inflammation even promotes tumor growth and then we get downstage tumor development uh, processes. So we're seeing a significant signal for all of these early stages of cancer cancer uh, prevention, which is a potential resolution to something known as PEDO's paradox, which is the observation that large species do not get cancer as often as they should, given how large they are. Um, the prediction is just because large species have more cells going from left to right, they should have a higher probability of getting cancer. This line in theory, what should happen, but we act, what we actually observe is more equal cancer rates across species. So one possible explanation for this is that as species get larger, they have lower mutation rates. And my work is suggesting that there's a whole host of cancer control mechanisms that are actually at work helping to prevent these large species from getting cancer. If we look at the other side of things, this is the independently long-lived phenotype. 
we see the same sort of large scale story with immune function and a more diverse set of DNA repair pathways. But if we look under the hood a little bit more, we can see that for these DNA repair pathways, this is showing their enrichment um, and orange is PC2. So if we see this sort of uptick to the right, that's indicating um, enrichment. We're seeing a lot stronger signal for these DNA repair pathways for PC2 in orange versus PC1, which is sort of flatter or has a weaker signal in comparison. And if we look at the immune pathways, don't read these. These are just a bunch of immune pathways, so don't worry about what their actual names are. Um, the bars are representing whether or not there's a significant enrichment in that pathway. And basically the takeaway from this is that the, when there is a bar for PC2, there is not for PC1 and vice versa with the exception of these couple NF kappa B pathways, which is indicating although immune functions are important, it's a distinct set of immune pathways for these two phenotypes. So there were really distinct evolutionary trajectories leading to long life and large body size versus long lifespan independent of body size. Uh, so with that, we'll thank everyone who has been involved with this and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Amanda, that's super cool. We got a question from Alex Chen. Did you calculate DN over DS values for each of the genes across all four categories of animals? So in our branch length calculations, those are DN. Um, so our branch lengths are the number of non-synonymous mutations with, with corrections. Um, we did do branch site models for positive selection on genes that were like on all four categories, basically, as you're saying, we saw very little signal for positive selection in any of the genes that we were, that we thought that we may see that type of signal for. Alex also asked, what about correlations between evolution of one gene and another, e.g. inflammation ones and DNA repair ones, like OGG1 or TNF-alpha? Yeah, yeah, so I haven't looked at those, but that's something that we work on in the lab as well. That's called evolutionary rate covariation or ERC. And there are definitely some genes that sort of evolve together um, both because of actual physical interactions between the protein products, as well as just because they're under similar evolutionary um, pressures. Um, so we're aware of that. And there's actually a bunch of corrections in the stuff that I do that I didn't go over called permulations to try to correct for the fact that, that this sort of intercorrelation of genes exists. So the functional categories that you uh, found for molecules for example, homologous recombination. I mean, obviously that pathway exists in the small short-lived animals and the large long-lived animals. So are you saying more that the pathway became more efficient? Yeah, so our argument is that that pathway is being protected from mutations and in evolutionary time scales, if it's being protected from mutations more, that will lead to slower evolutionary rates. So in the smaller species, since it's not as important, it's not as big of an issue if it's not sort of working as well, if it gets kind of a little mutation and it, it's not as big of a deal. So that's the type of signal that we're, that we're picking up. All right. Can alpha fold two allow us to model the geometry of all these different genes, <laughs> i.e., <laughs> structure of short-lived DNA repair genes versus long-lived DNA repair genes? I mean, I suppose if that's protein modeling software, to be honest, I have no idea what that is. I think it sounds like protein modeling, you know, the actual structure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sure. I don't do protein modeling, but if you're a protein modeler, sure, go for it. But the homologous recombination thing is of a lot of interest to me because that's actually mm -hmm. one of the things we study. Um, we found that in um, old yeast, the homologous recombination efficiency goes down because the proteins aren't made and Actually, when we overexpressed the homologous recombination proteins in the old yeast, they could then live longer, which to, to my knowledge is kind of the first example of showing that improved repair in an organism can make the organism live longer. So I'm really glad you found HR. <laughs> 
No, that's really interesting. It sounds like that's something like regulatory, maybe. I mean, maybe like the regulatory functionalities of those proteins aren't working as well. I don't know. That's I'm working on that now on the regulatory sort of side of the story. So well, that's we really usually found a defect in protein synthesis mm -hmm. in old yeast, oh. which kind of led to less proteins. Interesting. <laughs> Um, okay, I'd like to thank the speakers for really clear, exciting talks.